Hello. I'm uh, I'm from Kitware. I um work with Bill Hoffman. Um, oh, very good. And he uh, mentioned about this meeting, and I'm like, I need to I need to come because I also um work with various organizations, DOE funded organizations, where software metrics and software scorecards are 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 going to be a an important factor. And the chaos stuff is often referenced. So I thought I'd show up. Very good. Welcome. We'll see we'll see how many people we have or if we have enough people for this this meeting this week. Um the timing is a little unfortunate. I know um John Doggan is traveling and he normally runs this meeting. So I'm just running it in his place. And I know that the um, past conference is in Zurich starting on Monday. And so I think some people might be traveling for that as well. So we'll we'll give we'll give it a couple of minutes and see if anybody else shows up. Um, well, at least I know where to come to next time. <laughs> <laughs> Which so organization what, uh, are you from, Don? Oh, yeah, sorry. So I, I'm the director of data science for the Chaos Project. Okay. So I work uh, primarily primarily on chaos. My, uh, oh, hey, Bill. My background is actually more on the, on the corporate side, frankly. So I used to be director of open source community strategy at VMware um, prior to this, and I worked at Intel and a few other places. Hey, Bill. Burke and I were just getting to know each other. Hey. Good morning, Bill. I was telling him, I think it's, I suspect it's going to be kind of a light meeting. Sean is traveling, so he's not available. Um, and I know there's a, the, I don't know if you're going to the past conference in Zurich next week. I know a few of us and some of the Oak Ridge folks will be there. Yeah, I'm not going. I think it might be it might be a light one. So who's normally on this meeting? I didn't see the uh yeah, bill, I'm uh, just gonna send you the you might the listen. Yeah, if you can it, it, maybe you can if you can add me also to the invite, then I would also see the list. Let me uh yeah, we don't really do the invites that way. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, we have a calendar where you can uh, okay. basically download the invite to your to your calendar yeah, or okay. import it in your calendar. Um, but you can see sort of in the, like these were the attendees for for last week. So the doc has the attendees for um, yeah various right various okay meetings so you can. Was there anything in particular you both wanted to, to chat about this week? I'm just getting acquainted with the meeting, so I I uh, I was just going to see what was happening. <laughs> so yeah, I don't have to which. How about you, Bill? Was there anything you wanted to talk about this week? Um so as far as uh is there like a framework for the chaos measurement software? Like if we wanted to add other things into it or how, how does that all work? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that I understand your question. Well, um, there's, there's some automated stuff that you can like add in repositories, right? That, um, do some measurements. Of yeah. Okay. Quality. So, um, yes. So, so what we have within the chaos project, we have a few, a few different things. So we have software. So there, there is. Um, sorry. Let me just let me just reshare and let me. Oh, hey, Georg. Oh, and Bill has a visitor. Nice. I like him. People's pets and kids make their appearance. 
Um, uh, okay, yeah. So, so within the chaos project, we have we have a few few things. We have um, we have metrics definitions and metrics models, which are collections of of metrics. So we we certainly have have lots of lots of metrics defined. And you can also participate in that. So if there are some metrics that you're looking for that are not yet defined, uh, you can certainly help us define new metrics. So that's, that's one way to um, contribute to the chaos project and participate. And most of that happens. Uh, so Burke, you were asking about getting invites to, to the calendar. You can see that uh, all of our calendar entries are, are here on the chaos chaos calendar so you can download the ones that, that you're interested in attending if you're interested in actually working on metrics we have uh, metrics uh, metrics definition meetings so we had one last week there's metrics models working group and a metrics development working group so that's that's one way that you can you can get engaged in the project uh, as Bill mentioned we also have software. So we have primarily uh, two pieces of software within the Chaos Project. There's the uh, Augur software and uh, Grimoire Lab. And so, uh, so we have two, two different software packages that you can, and you can look at the pros and cons of, of each one on the, the software page here. But I think what you were asking about specifically, um, Bill was, was these, this piece, which is um, being able to actually add your own repositories and get visualizations for them. Was this, Bill, was this what you were talking about? Yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so so you can actually, there are detailed instructions for, for doing this. You can, um, instructions for logging into Augur and adding your repositories, and then you can use any of the visualizations that are that are on this page. So I'll drop those notes, that note into the... Um, we, uh, I don't know, Georg, if you wanna talk a little bit about uh, how people might use from our lab like I, I, I guess cauldron people could add their own repositories there I'm not sure if that's still something that that you're working on Don, Georg, if you're talking your Don was that Georg, your... If... sorry what Addy was that for me I'm sorry I did, just got my audio to work no Georg um okay sorry yeah no worries i don't know if he gay or care but he's on mute um realize we've got to uh, sorry oh, i gayer. stepped away from my desk for a second <laughs> with my headphones on so i heard the question I'm happy to okay. answer the uh, I can talk about cauldron for sure uh, how that works for collecting data um, should I open share my screen yeah okay I'm putting the link in the chat. Drop and, it in the minutes uh, too. Oh, good. Yes. Uh, I also want to give a disclaimer that Cauldron was an attempt to come up with a SaaS solution for offering community metrics, and we have not figured out how to make it profitable and so our focus has shifted away from it so we have we're not actively extending the platform anymore 
So what you get is what you get. Uh, I am already logged in, so let me log out. When you come here, the workflow is that you go to create a new report at the top right. I assume you see my screen. Yep. Perfect. So when you create a new report um, and you give it a report name, let's say we want to analyze the chaos project, we can add a variety of different data sources. And this, this is one of the powerful things of Cauldron that you're not limited to only looking at one type of data. In this case, chaos is in GitHub. And so we can add GitHub, you need to authorize GitHub, and so you need to provide your username. Login already did this, so it just goes through. And it looks like I already have a report called Chaos, so let's call it 2024.05.30, because that'll be unique. And then here, I can add, either I go to GitHub, go to the Chaos project, and I take the URL of the entire project, or I can go and open a repository and drop in that link. And so for chaos, I'll, I want all repositories. And I add that entire um, organization and it'll go and add all the repositories underneath it. I could add more. So I could go back here and add another GitHub if it was located somewhere else. I don't want to do that. So I will just go and create report for the chaos organization. And now Cauldron goes out through this, through GitHub, looks at the list of repositories and starts collecting all of the data. One of the awesome things about Cauldron is that the data, once it's loaded, it doesn't have to collect it again. So if someone else already analyzed the chaos project, that data will be in here. And I'm pretty sure I have looked at chaos before, so the data should be here in a moment without having to wait for all the data collection to complete. So if you created a report and then someone else did the same community, they will benefit from the data being already collected for your report. And the same is true for Augur. It, it works kind of the same way. You could go share uh, software as a service. Yeah. The being able to share data has some implications for uh, for data about contributors because when you take Grimoire Lab, the software this is built on, one of the features it has is managing affiliations of contributors. So being able to track what organization someone belongs to so that we can see how organizations through their students, faculty, employees, and so on, are active in an open source project. That kind of information, because it's personal identifiable information, we cannot share across different users. And so in Cauldron, you would not have that data. You would have to use Grimoire Lab uh, directly to be able to look at organizations. So Bill, did this answer your question? Yeah, yeah, this is good. Okay. Cool. So you said that it's not actively being developed because you couldn't find a business model for it? That is correct. So Cauldron is not a chaos project. It's um, a Viturgia project built on top of Grimoire Lab, which is a chaos project. Okay. Does that make sense? If you're, if, if you're thinking right now, but 
there is this obvious business model. Please let me know. I'm happy to try it and see if we can make this work and make money and support this long term and provide it to the community. No, nope, didn't have an idea. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I thought I asked. Yeah, I was just right, curious. Cool. But that was, yeah, for, well, I thought it was part of the Linux Foundation, but I guess if it's something separate, that's why it needs a business model. But. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's based on based on a chaos project. So one of the, the there's a lot of moving piece, a lot of stakeholders in chaos. The, the chaos project at the Linux Foundation is where we all come together as an industry and open source and maintainers and foundations to standardize metrics and build software. One piece of software, the Grimoire Lab software, was donated by a company, Biturgia. Biturgia has been doing this for 13, 14 years as a company. I, I forgot how old we are. And built the software. And then when chaos started emerging, one of the reasons was Biturgia was providing metrics and dashboards to the Linux Foundation and said, hey, our software is open source, can be also hosted at the Linux Foundation. And the Chaos became the host of that software, Grimoire Lab. There's still a business around it with Biturgia, where we provide hosting and consultancy, metric strategy, all kinds of things related to the software. Um, but it's outside of the Chaos project. We're still very active in the Chaos project. So that's that relationship between Chaos and Petrugia. Okay, thanks, Garrick. You're welcome. Always happy to talk about this. <laughs> um, Addy, did you have anything else that you wanted to add to the agenda for this week? Um, not for this week, Don. We still owe you which uh, which matrix we want to start seeing in Augur, so we're still trying to collect that information. Okay, cool, perfect. Um, well, the only other thing I had on the agenda was, um, if you're interested, I can give you a preview of my talk that I'm going to do at mm -hmm. um, at PASC next week. So oh, yeah, that'd be great. I know I'm gonna miss tasks, so it'd be good for. I know I'm disappointed that you're not able to make it. Yeah, I'm so sorry it didn't work out this year. I would really like to be there. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Well, let me share my screen. Okay. Yes, I can see your screen, the slide. Yeah, I'm, now I'm missing part of, sorry. I'm just on my laptop and I don't have my monitor and things aren't quite, okay. uh, can you still see the screen? Yes. yes, you can see it. Okay, cool. Okay, so I'll kind of walk you through the, the presentation. Uh, feel free to interrupt me if you have questions, so don't don't save those to the end, just, uh, just give me a shout and we can chat about it. Um, I usually start by thanking the, the foundation to provide support for the chaos project. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about, about me, um, not much. I've been in the tech industry for over 20 years doing mostly open source. Um, and I spent a lot of time thinking about how people can use metrics to understand how to measure and make improvements to open source project health and sustainability. I will start the presentation with a quick overview of the chaos project, along with some thoughts on how to approach using metrics to improve the sustainability of the project. And we'll look at it across a few categories, responsiveness, contributor sustainability, organizational participation, and security. And then I'll talk about some additional considerations to leave you with just a few final thoughts. So uh, I think you're all 
familiar with the chaos project, so I'm just gonna skip this slide. So, so people love comprehensive lists and data, especially within the scientific communities. But when it comes to metrics, that, uh, that approach can actually sometimes backfire on people because one of the biggest challenges people have with metrics for open source projects where all of the data is available to gather and analyze is that it can be overwhelming. And we only have so many hours in the day, so we just we can't focus on everything. So within the chaos project, we like to use the goal question metric approach with the idea that you focus first on your goals and what you're trying to accomplish, which helps you understand the questions you have that can be answered by the data. And only then do you move on to the specific metrics to answer those questions. Because no two open source projects are exactly the same. This also helps you come up with metrics that are most appropriate for the projects that you want to understand more about. So quite a few metrics tools, including the ones we have within Chaos, display what I affectionately call a wall of metrics. These are pages and pages of visualization that you can use to understand your open source project, but they require you to know what you're looking at and know where to focus your energy to get the data that you need. And we have dozens and dozens of metrics and all of them can be super useful, but which ones you focus on depend on what you're trying to achieve or understand, which is why starting with Google is it's so important. Now we just launched a series of practitioner guides, which are designed to be used by people who may or may not be experts in data analysis or open source to help them understand how to interpret that incoming tsunami of data generated by open source projects with the goal of finding ways to improve the health of those projects. And the guides are useful for anybody who wants to better understand project health and take action or take action on what they want to learn from their metrics to make the projects more sustainable. We launched with an introduction guide and guides on three topics that I'll talk about in the next couple of slides, but we also have more guides coming soon. Um, okay, sorry, I was just, saw somebody join. Um, so unresponsiveness, seeing large numbers of neglected issues and change requests on a project is, is a red flag for me because it can indicate that they either don't actually care about or want contributions from others, which is something you see in some company-owned open source projects or in the scientific space where researchers sometimes open source projects that they only plan to use for their own internal research needs. And it's important for projects to respond to pull requests in a timely manner because a quick response can help you retain contributors who otherwise might become discouraged if they don't receive a timely response. So timely, thoughtful, and kind responses to contributors indicate that you appreciate their work. Being responsive to the contributions of other people helps grow the community and improve contributor sustainability, which I'll talk about in a minute. So while, while quick responses are important, it's also important to keep up with change requests. So pull requests or merge requests and resolve them in a timely manner. Even if the response is closing requests that won't be merged, it's easy to get behind on incoming contributions and we all get behind sometimes, but not addressing these contributions promptly creates technical debt and reduces the chances that they'll ever be merged uh, because we'll just have too many merge conflicts. But in both of the response of these metrics, it's really important to focus on the trends. So if you see responsiveness declining over time, then it might be time to find ways to improve it including recruiting more contributors and maintainers for your project. And the Responsiveness Practitioner Guide, which is uh, linked at the bottom of the slide, has a bunch of details on ways to improve responsiveness for projects that you care about. Contributor sustainability is also an important part of assessing whether an open source project and community has enough contributors for the project to be sustained over the long term. Can I ask so, a question? Yeah, sure, go for it. Uh, in the previous slide, you um, it looked like number of PRs um, is the sort of the metric for responsiveness that the ones that are open at, at a time. I'm guessing um, the um, but couldn't that also don't you have to correlate that with sort of the growth of the project because if the project goes from ten 
10 overall developers to 100 developers, the number of PRs are like uh, open PRs are likely to grow just as a natural extension of that of that growth. Yes, absolutely. So one of the key things on these um, practitioner guides uh, in, in general is that you really need to interpret these metrics in light of what's happening in the project. So this in particular is responsiveness. So this is looking at uh, closure ratio. So how well your project actually closes pull requests that are coming in. So the black line is the total pull request, the green dotted line underneath it. Is the so you're looking at closed. both, okay. Yeah, so you're look, I'm looking at both because um, because that's it's one of the measures of, of responsiveness. You know, another one is time to first response. So this is looking at the total number of pull requests and the ones that were responded to within um, two business days, which was which just kind of an arbitrary threshold that I said. It was what we what we used as guidance when I worked at VMware. Um, but you're absolutely right. So you do need to, and it's really important to interpret these metrics in light of all of the things that are that are going on within your project. You know, if your project is experiencing tremendous growth, then it's likely that responsiveness would be slower while you figure out how to, you know, how to handle that that growth that your project is, is experiencing. So that's one of the things. There's a make improvements section in the um, responsiveness guides, or sorry, in the practitioner guides. That, that help you think about what other things you should be thinking about and how to interpret these in light of the particular needs that your project has. Cool. Um, so yeah, so contributor sustainability has a huge impact on overall project sustainability. There are lots of projects with single maintainer, especially in the scientific software space. Uh, many projects really struggle to find enough people to actively participate in their projects and continue to maintain them over the long term. And the reality is that there are a lot of open source projects and just not enough contributors. So maintainers in general are in desperate need for help across the various types of contributions needed to have a successful and sustainable open source project. And if there aren't enough contributors to sustain a project, this increases the risk that the project will fail which creates a variety of significant challenges for users and other projects that depend on it. I recommend measuring contributor sustainability because there are a couple of things that can tell you. First, how big of an issue is your current contributor situation? If it's like the one on this slide, you really should focus on getting a few more people who can contribute and eventually being moved into leadership roles like maintainer. You might also find that there are more people contributing more than you realize, which is the other reason that this is a good metric. It can help you think about who you can encourage to contribute more and maybe find someone who can move into a maintainer role. And reaching out to someone and acknowledging their work while encouraging them to do more can really help with growing your contributor base. Now the catch here, uh, and with many metrics, is that we just don't, we don't just want to think about the people who are making comments like the example on this graph. It's a good start, but you should also be thinking about how you can move people into leadership positions to responsible, be responsible for things that might not show up in your system data, like documentation, community management, marketing, and other, other things that take up maintainers' valuable time. And so the practitioner guide linked on this slide also has um, suggestions for how to improve contributor sustainability. Another area is organizational participation. So we don't always spend enough time thinking about how organizational participation impacts the sustainability of open source projects. So you should also look at organizational diversity as part of the health and risk for open source projects. If all or most of the contributions are from people at a single company, what happens when that company has a shift in strategy or gets acquired or runs out of money, goes out of business? Would the project be able to continue if the company pulled all of its employees out of the project? These single vendor open source projects might not seem risky, especially when they're backed by a big company, but they can really quickly become unviable after a licensing change or when everyone stops working on that project. And this is also a risk for scientific software and not just for the projects driven out of companies. Individual researchers, research groups, other collections of people driving these projects can run out of funding, right? Or, or change their research methods, leading to abandoned projects that other people were using. 
the biggest challenge with identifying trends for organizations and open source projects is that the organizational affiliation data is almost never accurate enough to use without some manual tooling up. So the example here is relatively clean compared to a lot of others, but you can still see that about 20% of the contributors aren't matched to organizations. And if most of the work is being done by people at a single organization, like in this example, the project might be riskier to use and harder to contribute to than a project with contributions that are spread out over many organizations with no single organization as dominant. If you work for that dominant organization, you might wanna focus on getting more contributors from some other orga organizations by reaching out to people you know who are using the project and might be interested in contributing. And again, this is described in more detail in that practitioner guide that's on the bottom of the slide. We don't actually have a practitioner guide for security yet, uh, but it's on our list to develop one and it's the one that I'm working on next. And it's important to think about from the standpoint of project sustainability. One thing I look for when assessing sustainability is whether they make regular releases and quickly catch security vulnerabilities. You can also look at change requests as part of this assessment to see if they're making changes to fix vulnerabilities and other, make other improvements. And in addition to just looking at the project itself, it's also important to look at the dependencies. And the live year metric can help you see whether the project also keeps their dependencies up to date since outdated dependencies can be a significant security risk. People tend not to trust projects with unpatched security vulnerabilities and are more likely to adopt projects that they trust to be more secure. In short, projects that take a proactive approach to addressing security issues and releasing fixes are more sustainable over the long term. It's important to look at the frequency of security. Uh, including all the releases, even the like the teeny tiny point releases, because it's critical that security um, updates and yeah, fixes land in a release in a timely manner. Yeah. And it's important to get those new features out too. An appropriate release frequency for a project is influenced by the size of it and how many dependencies it has on other projects that are also releasing fixes. So you should think about whether the project is cutting releases frequently enough to keep the project up to date and secure. Now, as you all know, measuring project sustainability is a complex task. Within the corporate world, we tend to think of project sustainability in terms of viability. Is the project likely to be viable over the long term? So Gary White from Verizon developed four metric models, each on one of the focus topics listed on this slide, along with a fifth starter viability model, the smaller subset of metrics to help people get started. And I've already covered quite a few of the metrics in these models, but uh, I organize them slightly differently in the context of responsiveness, contributor sustainability, organizational participation, and security. But the first link at the bottom of the slide is to a three-part blog post series that Gary wrote to help people understand the models and how to use them. So I encourage you to have a look at those blog posts to look for other sustainability metrics that you might be interested in using. And the second link is to our metrics model page where you can find the details about all of the models. And the metrics in these models can help you further expand how you assess sustainability for projects that you care about. So these are kind of the, the next steps. Building sustainable open source projects over the long term can be a challenge, right? Especially within the scientific software space. Project leaders and contributors are busy people who don't always have the time to focus on growing a community and maintaining their software along with their other research commitments. Using metrics is one way to help research and scientific software projects identify potential issues in areas where they can improve their project to make it more sustainable over the long term. Being proactive about improving sustainability before it becomes a crisis can help make research and scientific software more sustainable and reliable for all of us. With that, we have come to the end of the presentation. Are there any any questions about any of this? Was well, good. <laughs> nice yeah. presentation. Thanks, Tom. Can you uh, share? Can you share the slides by any chance? Yes, I will. What uh, I have to I have to upload them somewhere. I'll share them. Yeah, this is a 
meta question, not about the presentation. The guide still has bus factor listed, and I saw somewhere that be decided, or I don't know how far we are with renaming it yet. We have almost finished renaming it. Um, we had originally, we in the last metrics development working group, so, so I don't know if we've talked about it in this meeting or not, but we're renaming the bus factor metric because the idea is that how many people need to get hit by a bus before your project becomes unsustainable, uh, which is uh, dark. So we'd like something less, uh, um, yeah, less. But that's, that's I mean, that's used so, uh, so commonly. <laughs> yeah, um, we just want something a little less, uh, yeah, a little less dark, a little less. I've heard uh, like dark. win the lottery. I noticed yeah. that how many people would leave, leave the project you were saying instead of bus factor. Yeah. Um, yeah, we talked about lottery factor too. That was, that was actually what I wanted to rename it um, initially. And then uh, we started having a conversation about um, how uh, lottery is a big factor in um, problem gambling, um, especially in rural parts of the U.S. So, so we decided not to go with that one. That's that's what I've been calling this for for years, actually. Well, it, I, so and I, I think, think, and I think it's inaccurate. If I win the lottery, I'm I, I you know, I can contribute whatever the heck I want, as opposed to whatever somebody pays me to do. So I might actually contribute more. Yes, this is the other <laughs> problem with that that analogy because I have had so many maintainers. They're like, no, 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 I get to work more on my open source project. <laughs> um, so I think we've decided to stop being clever and just make it descriptive like the rest of the chaos metrics. And so we had originally just called it contributor risk. So that was what we landed on in the last metrics development uh, working group. Um, there was a concern that that is just a little bit too generic and someone suggested um, contributor abandonment risk instead, which I actually think is is probably a little bit better because it does get at that abandonment um, piece of it. And contributor risk could mean more than just what we've traditionally called the bus factor. So I'm actually now leaning towards that. And so we're gonna talk about it next week in the metrics development working group meeting. At this point, uh, I've been working on renaming this metric for like three months and I am so tired of naming things. Um, so I'm ready to land on anything at this point. Um, but, but yes, Georg, I've still, I've still got it as a bus factor until we officially, officially rename it and, and, and do the pull request to make the changes, yeah. which is gonna be, um, which is gonna be a significant chunk of work, right? Because it is mentioned in a bunch of places across the chaos project. So yeah. Happy to departure. <laughs> <laughs> oh, naming is hard, naming is so hard. We should invent a new language that no one will understand it, but it makes perfect sense. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I like departure because it doesn't, you know, if someone does get hit by a bus, they're not really abandoning the project. Abandon yeah. kind of has a connotation of they gave up on it, they walked away or whatever. It's just departure from the project. <laughs> Yeah, that's a really good point. Separation, you know, so, something that doesn't imply something bad happened to them or something great happened to them. It's just, they're not there anymore. Then what happens yeah. for whatever reason? Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna, I, I might I might like that better. I think right now I'm so tired of renaming that any suggestion people come up yeah. with, I'm like, yes, let, let's do it. Uh, but I actually really do like the departure departure better than abandonment because you're right it's not always it's not always abandonment yeah that has okay. sort of a negative connotation like <laughs> yeah child okay abandonment i'm gonna is what comes to my mind <laughs> <laughs> all right departure i'm gonna add that to the to the list to talk about next week okay and i will um yeah, like I said, I'll, I'll put these slides somewhere. Are all of you in the uh, working group Slack channel? I think I'm on it. Um, how, how do you join? Uh, the, sorry, the Slack channel? Yeah. Um, yeah, just uh, let me, let me grab a, a link and I can 
drop it in the chat. Okay, so that should take you to join the Chaos Slack. And then there's a, a Slack channel called um, WG-Science-Research-OSF. Which I thought, I thought you were in the... the yeah, I'm in this one. Okay, I'm sorry, I misunderstood. I thought there was a workspace for this. Ah, no, 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 a Slack, sorry, a Slack workspace. That's what the, yeah, sorry. Okay. It's a Slack channel within the Chaos workspace. Gotcha, thank you. I was thinking it was, <laughs> there was another workspace that I'm missing on. No, no, it's just the, the Slack, Slack channel. Um, because I can, I can just upload those the slides there. Sure, yeah, it's and, on, and then I can all have access to the links and everything. Yeah, if you could put the link in the, the agenda document, that'd be good. Once you have yeah, somewhere you can that. link to. <laughs> yeah, we'll do. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks. Any, uh, anything else you want to talk about? Okay, well, I think, yeah, I think if there's nothing else, we can give people a few extra minutes back in your day. And so thanks everybody. Thanks everybody for coming and for the discussion. And we'll see you all again in about two weeks. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Right. Well, I'm, I'm going to chat you in just a second. Yep, absolutely. Thanks. Okay, bye. Bye.